goodness. I hope you got to hear some of what Lee had to say about it. You know, I didn't, but he, um, he came back and told me that he was talking about when he was in the dressing room and Elvis was talking to me on the phone. Yeah. And, um, like the only place Elvis could go for privacy was to go in and the yeah. door was closed and the phone line was under yeah. the door. But how great is Lee Majors? Oh. He's such a wonderful human being. I did the fall guy with him a couple of times. That's right. I started on that show with him, and he's just the night. He's as nice as he appears to be. He's just kind and generous. And a little known fact: he actually paid for my wedding with Bruce Jenner. <laughs> he does want his money back. <laughs> Just talking about we had uh, you, you you you've come to Tupelo before and been a part of the Tupelo Elvis Festival and, and we talked there and you got to go out to the birthplace to, to see Elvis's birthplace that was amazing and to, to come up here and visit uh, Graceland then and we've spent a lot of hours over the last few days up at the mansion and I think yeah. for those uh, people that were not lucky enough to be among those that, that went on your tours what was that like for you to be back in that in that, in that uh -huh. era? You know, it was bittersweet, very nostalgic, you know, when you go back to where you have lived for four and a half years, and all the incredible memories, the, I always like to call them rarefied memories, because I fully grasp how fortunate I am, how very blessed and lucky I am, to have not only known Elvis, but to have loved him, and to have been loved by him. So it's, it's, it was kind of um, nostalgic for me to go back there, and I think that for those of you who have been through Graceland, and I'm assuming most of you have, you know, you still feel his energy there. His energy is still very much there, and his essence, because that was truly home for him. He absolutely loved Graceland, and they've done such an incredible job of preserving it and maintaining it, and um, so it's, it was just wonderful. It was like, you know, two weeks had passed, really. When I walk in, I feel like I, I, I must expect him to come down the stairs and you know, say hello. It, it must be, it was so different than, you can tell us stories about being at Graceland, but you would walk to places where, you know, like here's where we would, here's where I would be when Elvis would go in to see Dodger, or here's where we would sit, and the, to be physically able to go around and to, to be in those spots. And, and you really fed off the energy of the, of the fans, too. Yeah, the fans, well, Elvis has the most spectacular fans on the planet. The most devoted. <laughs> You truly deserve all the credit for keeping his memory and his legacy and his music alive because it's, it's never happened before and won't happen ever again in history that uh, this kind of fan base exists. You know, you guys are loyal, you're devoted, you're just absolutely religious about Elvis and um, he would be uh, astounded. He would be staggered to know how incredibly devoted and loving and faithful you all are. And you know, I used to say that you know we do celebrated people a disservice by putting them on a pedestal and not allowing them to be human. But I feel like Elvis's fans allow him to be human as well as this incredible demigod. You know that yeah. that yeah. is that is on a pedestal still. But you know we, you know we take the hits for him and we love him and allow him to be human as well. And there's a whole new generation. There's so many. I, I, I asked this earlier. You're going to be amazed by this. Who's at uh, an Elvis Week event for? The, excuse me. Who's at an Elvis Week event for the very first time? Invited uh, by Graceland and yeah. UPE to um, be here and, and participate in a lot of the events, and well, I'm so happy that I am. Now, as you came out looking gorgeous, thank you. As, as you, as I knew you would, I was blinded as the spotlight hit this necklace. Yeah. It's just, you know. I wore this for y'all. <laughs> in a safe deposit box as I do all the Elvis jewelry you know I, I'm it's such a treasure for me and 
the world is so crazy today, you know, I don't wear jewelry. Well, <laughs> I lie. <laughs> but these are the things I bought myself, though. But all this jewelry I keep in a safe deposit box. But I thought the fans would like to see uh, my TLC that Elvis dubbed the mother of all TLCs. So the, the ones that he would put around the ladies' necks were beautiful and gold, but smaller. And he designed this and had this made specifically for me. It's got uh, baguette diamonds in the lightning bolt and round diamonds in the TLC, tender loving care. And he said, you know, you deserve this. You treat me so well with such tender loving care. So you get the mother of all TLCs. She's very sweet. You also cooked with TLC, too. I sure did. Yeah. <laughs> I still do for my grandchildren. Yeah. Still can make a mean peanut butter and banana sandwich. Yeah. Tell us, okay, tell us the, how did the official Linda Thompson way of TLC I'd like banana to take credit for it, but it's really the Elvis Presley way exactly. of creating a peanut butter and banana sandwich. You mash the bananas, it has to be a ripe banana, you mash it up, blend peanut butter in the mashed bananas, take two pieces of white bread, preferably, you know, Wonder Bread, and put the mixture in the bread, and then you melt a stick of butter. A stick. <laughs> much a stick, it's a lot, a lot of butter, and you saturate both sides of the bread and fry it like a toasted cheese, like a grilled cheese sandwich, but it's peanut butter and banana. And you know, honestly, I don't think I ever saw him eat a full one, but he just wanted to have a few bites. I told you this story yeah. last night about he would ask me to, uh, honey, would you go downstairs and make me some bacon and eggs? And I said, well, do you want Pauline or Lottie or somebody to do it? No, I want you to do it because it tastes better when you make it. I said, okay, so of course I accommodated him. <laughs> Went down, and the first time I ever made uh, bacon and eggs for him, it was like three eggs, you know, and four slices of bacon. I go back up with the tray and put it down on the bed in front of him, and he looks at it. He said, what is this? I said, it's your bacon and eggs. And he said, honey, I'm rich. <laughs> I used to be really poor, and you know we didn't have a lot of food to eat. And he said, this looks like when I was poor and didn't have enough food to eat. I said, I want you to go back down there and put at least six eggs together and a half a pound of bacon. I won't eat it all, but I just want to see it in front of me. I just want to know I can afford that. <laughs> so, I mean, he's still felt he had such a humility, really, and still felt in his heart that he remembered when he was poor and didn't have an, enough food and, um, and wanted to remind himself, now he did. <laughs> that, that sense of where he came from seemed to always still be with him. And one of the things we, that we found out in talking to Angie, the you know, head, head of archives, is that you know, Vernon saved everything because he was, uh, uh, through the Depression, it could go away. Yeah, absolutely. That stayed with Elvis. Either. Yeah, not as much with Elvis. Yeah. I mean, Elvis honestly didn't care about money. He didn't care about hoarding money. He had such a generous spirit. And he would often say, you know, I derive so much more pleasure from giving than receiving. He was a very difficult person to buy for, as you can imagine, because he had everything. And if he didn't have it, he could go out and buy it. Yeah. And, you know, he spent his money. God bless him. He lived for the day. You know, he, he lived the way we all are um, admonished to live. You know, t today is the present. This is the day we should grasp and rejoice in. You know, so he did live that way. But he derived incredible pleasure from giving um, and, and would much rather see someone's face having received a gift from him than for them to bring him a gift. You know? Yeah, I've had, I remember read and a couple of people, Dick Grove, I think, said that one of the things they would tell people when they were going to introduce someone to Elvis for the first time was, whatever you do, don't tell him you like his watch. Exactly, don't compliment him on anything don't he's wearing. Because he'll just give it to you. Yes, I don't have that affliction. So yes. You can tell me you like my things. Because I was going to tell you, I love that Do you? Yes. Which one? What size does your wife wear? Exactly. Um, no, but honestly, that's the truth. If you yeah. said to Elvis, if you would go up to him and say, oh, that's a beautiful ring, you know, I, I love that. Really, you like it? Take it off, give it to you. You know, that's it. we called him Santa Claus because he had such a tremendous spirit of giving. Yeah. He's an incredible person. So how do you buy for the man who can buy anything for himself? How do you select a gift for him? It was really difficult. You know, the 
one of the, the, the best gifts that I was ab ever able to give Elvis was the Maltese cross. You guys have all seen that beautiful Maltese cross that he wore um, all the time in his shows. So it was Christmas time, our second Christmas together, and not knowing that Elvis never did anything for himself, you know, he would never indulge himself as much as he would indulge other people. I went to Lowell Hayes and I said, listen, I have this design, this beautiful Maltese cross I would love to have made for Elvis Pave diamonds, uh, my birthstone and his birthstone, turned sideways in a heart and joined by a single diamond with an eternity ring around those two hearts. Um, can you do this? And Lowell said, sure I can. So I went back home to Graceland and I said, honey, I want to buy you a nice Christmas present this year. But of course that means, of course, you'll pay for it. <laughs> but I want to do it for you. And he said, okay, sweetheart, well, how much, how much are we talking about? And I said, $25,000. He said, $25,000? And I said, now doesn't $8,000 sound better? <laughs> So ladies, remember that, if you're <laughs> or gentlemen. So it, it made 8,000 a lot more palatable for him. And he said, he started laughing, and he said, I see what you've done there. And he said, so honey, is it, is it 25 or is it eight? And I said, it's really, it's $8,000. He said, sweetheart, if you want to spend $8,000 on me for Christmas, please go ahead. So I got him the Maltese cross, and he absolutely adored it and wore it to every show um, thereafter. Yeah, and, and for, that's right. Somebody had one on uh, at the tour the Yes, other night. Lowell Hayes is still making those. They're not the diamonds, you know, and, yeah. the, and the garnets and the emeralds that were in the original. I bet he would, though, if I bet he would, wanted yeah. Them. Anybody yeah. wants to cough yeah. up a, yeah. a little more than 8,000 now in today's world, I think. For you to go back in Graceland, we were, one of the things that I got to do is I got to be your, um, audiovisual uh, uh, person. You're so uh, kind. <laughs> and, well, you know, to, to when you were there, and we, we, prefaced, we prefaced this story, um, it was the 70s, right? Uh, so talk a little bit about, uh, because they, we were answering a lot of uh, myths, like breaking a lot of myths, or maybe telling what into you is the, is the truth. Uh, about different things like the jungle room the jungle. and how the furniture came to be, but talk a little bit about the um, uh, your ideas for what you wanted to do in decorating and, and talking with Elvis about. Well, I basically deferred to Elvis's taste. You know, I just tried to help facilitate his wishes and and his taste, uh, including the jungle room. And we actually did go to Pier One and purchased a lot of that furniture there. And then Ingalls Interiors, uh, a guy named Bill Eubanks, helped us to you know make the dream come true <laughs> by uh, getting little trinkets and different things, and also to help with the fabrics in the pool room. Um, I had seen an ad in a, a magazine, and it looked like a Moroccan room with the tinted ceiling and the fabric uh, on the walls gathered. And I just thought it was so dramatic and very Elvis-esque. So that was the inspiration for the pool room. And the, those are two basement rooms. And the TV room, such a low ceiling, I said, let's mirror the ceiling and it'll heighten and make it look brighter and lighter. And the lightning bolt. So all those were you know, my suggestions, and Bill Eubanks helped to implement those. But the living room, Elvis wanted our bedroom, red, black, and gold. That, that's the colors that Elvis loved, red, black, and gold. And the bedroom is still those colors. Very dramatic, very rock and roll, very Elvis. So he said, I, let's do the living room in red. I want red shag carpet. I want you know velvet sofas. And so it was absolutely deferring to his taste. Um, which, you know, was questionable maybe, I don't know, <laughs> but, but, but he, it made him happy. And we jokingly said, you know, it looked a little bit like a bordello, but <laughs> a, little, <laughs> a, 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 a little a lot like a bordello. <laughs> but it was, it was his taste and it was him. And I, I know a lot of people wish that it was left as he had left it, where he last lived. His taste, his rock and roll Elvis taste, you know, left there. Um, but the jungle room, you know, we didn't call it the jungle room, it yeah. was the den. And
and Elvis loved Hawaii, had a terrific affinity for Hawaii. So we, we, that's, I think, how we were drawn to that furniture. But he was so cute. He said he was very little boyish. He was so much like a little child in so many ways, in the most beautiful ways. But he said, honey, I want to I wanna feel like there's moss growing on the floor, moss growing up the walls, moss on the ceiling. So we're going we're gonna to carpet all that and shag, green shag carpeting. I said, really, sweetheart? You want moss growing up the walls and on the ceiling? Yeah, that's what I want, sweetheart. I said, okay, you want it, you got it. It was his house. He had every right to decorate it in whatever fashion he wanted. But now it's become the most iconic room in the house. Everybody talks about the jungle room. Even Mark Cohen wrote that song, you know, Walking in Memphis, and the little, talks about the jungle room. Yeah. So Elvis had very specific taste. And, you know, he worked hard and he loved hard. And I, I felt like he deserved to have his wishes come true. So that's why, um, you know, we, we decorated it in the fashion that it's decorated. On one of the tours, uh, it might have been the first night, I was kind of at the back of the group and you were up at the front as we walked down that little hallway from the pool room up the stairs to the jungle room. And I could just hear you up front going, there's the moss. <laughs> Growing up the walls. Up You've the all been there, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. you know what I'm talking about, you yeah. know. But you can imagine him with the beautiful inflection in his voice. Honey, I just want to see like moss growing up that wall. Moss on the scene. <laughs> okay, sweetheart, you want it, you got it. <laughs> and the moss is still there. And how many of us have tried to talk our spouses into, can we carpet the scene? No, we can't carpet the scene. <laughs> and by the way, credit to the uh, Memphis carpet industry in the 70s who could install <laughs> carpet on the ceiling. No kidding. And it's still there. They did a great job. Yeah, that's amazing. Oh, and the stained glass peacocks, I should point yes, that out. Yes. That, um, you know, aren't they pretty? Yeah. And, and that did remain. Those have remained there, as well as the climbing roses at the front door, which I designed, and the pea above the front door. So I love stained glass. I have stained glass at my house in Malibu. Um, so. When we were living together, I said, honey, you know, this would be beautiful going from the living room into the music room if we could put stained glass peacocks. And he loved the idea because Elvis was a peacock. Even with the little capes that he would wear and come out on stage and spread the cape, it was like a beautiful peacock spreading its feathers, you know. And he had a lot of pride and dignity, you know, when he walked and... He just had his own uh, presence and charisma. So I said, you're a peacock, let's, let's put peacocks there. And they are so beautiful. Yeah. And so I'm, I was really happy to see that they're still there and, and still looking beautiful. And, and also the stained uh, glass in the front door. Gorgeous, gorgeous. And I'm glad you guys get to enjoy it too. That's fantastic. And you can wear them now from Lansky's. You can wear the peacocks. Yeah, you know, I gotta go shopping. Cool. Yeah. Um, one of the relationships in Elvis's life that uh, that you observed and we've, we've heard about it, but I, I loved hearing your memories of at night or uh, when Elvis was waking up uh, to go out for the evening, his always taking time to, to visit with Dodger. Yeah, it says a lot about his character and the depth of humanity that you know he embodied. Um, he, his grandmother lived with him. We called her Dodger. Sometimes he called her Grandma, but 95% of the time he called her Dodger. So we would be going to sleep at 8 o'clock in the morning. Dodger always got up at 8 o'clock in the morning and got dressed and put her little makeup on, and pulled, you know, pulled her hair back in a little bun, put her house dress on, and would walk to the kitchen and sit at the kitchen counter for breakfast. And, you know, we would come in and say, um, uh, good night, Dodger, and she said, "Good morning, son." <laughs> so she was good morning to us, but good night to her because we were going to bed, so our hours were totally turned around. Uh, but he was—he was so loving toward her. He was just a, an inordinately affectionate human being, anyway. And he needed a lot of affection, and he needed to give a lot of affection. So we would go into Dodger's room, and we would sit on the side of her bed there. I know you've all seen the little bedroom. We would sit on the side of the bed, and her rocking chair was right um, in front of her closet and across from the bed. And he would hold her hands and talk to her and kiss her on the top of her head, and she dips enough. <laughs> so, so he didn't kiss her on the lips. <laughs> But she was the cutest, cutest little woman, and she looked the same 
in her 80s as she did in her, I guess, 50s when yeah. they were in Germany. I see those photos, and you know, it's unmistakably Dodger, just as she looked when we knew her, you know, when I knew her. Um, but she was, she was quite the character, and I know that um, Elvis absolutely adored her. Yeah, and, and you bring up a subject of uh, something that, that I've been told this week to ask about, and I do this at the behest of women that wanted to know, we're talking about kissing, and... Am I supposed to kiss and tell now? Not a, well, you can kiss and whisper. Um, not a question I would have thought of on my own. But I'm doing this. I'm doing this at the behest. Well, remember what Jerry Reed said. Jerry Reed said, "You know, Elvis, I'm not that way, but man, I kiss you." I mean, you know, uh, kissing Elvis, you've come up with an explanation that perhaps. Well, it's could the help. closest, closest explanation that I could devise. And I wrote this in my memoir when I finally, finally wrote a memoir after everything else had, you know, you come had to some mind. stories to tell. I have so. had quite the crazy yeah. life. But I said if you take two big fluffy marshmallows, put them together, and the sweetness and the softness that they are, and you just kiss those marshmallows, that's the closest thing that I could come to imagining that would be like kissing Elvis. Because he did have the softest and sweetest lips and again he was so wonderfully affectionate that um, again I know how lucky I am and how blessed to have those memories and to be able to still close my eyes and imagine those kisses. Okay I asked the kissing question. Okay. And he always had good breath. Not really but he always always had good breath. Yeah, well, you said he smelled of... Uh, Neutrogena soap. Neutrogena soap. Yeah, he only used the original Neutrogena soap. So these are the little personal things that, you know, it, it's nice to know that about someone that you love and admire, and just little human touches like that. He always used Neutrogena soap, so he always had this little essence of uh, that clean, fresh smell of Neutrogena soap. Their sales are going to go up, aren't they? <laughs> You're welcome, Neutrogena. <laughs> Um, somebody called the Graceland gift shop. Uh, <laughs> some Neutrogena in there. Um, as we know, if we've read your book, which, by the way, thank you for finally putting your story out. <laughs> wonderful experiences. You are uh, obviously an award-winning songwriter, lyricist now, uh, known for that now. But you were writing lyrics and didn't realize, really, you thought you were writing poetry for Elvis, but he recognized. Yeah, I used to write him love sonnets and poetry, and he would often say to me, honey, this is beautiful, I love this one, can I have someone put this to music? Because, as you know, Elvis didn't write music, he just you know, made it come to life. He stylized every song that he ever did and made it his own, so he didn't even need to write. But um, he would say, let me have someone put this to music and I'll record it. And in my naivete, and just trying to keep something personal, you know, between us that wasn't shared with the world, I would say, no, honey, you know, this is just private between you and me. Had I known about music publishing and royalties, I might have been a little bit more mercenary in that. Yeah. And, you know, and, and let him do it. And, and even beyond that, there's a Christmas song that I wrote called Grown Up Christmas List. And that was Elvis's favorite holiday, it's Christmas. You guys know that song, Grown Up Christmas List? So it's been recorded by Barbra Streisand, Natalie Cole, Kelly Clarkson, Amy yeah. Grant, Michael Bublé, like every artist um, it, feel, it feels like has recorded that song. But I would have loved to have heard Elvis's beautiful voice singing those words, you know, so it would have been uh, very gratifying for me if I had let him record some of my uh, tunes, yeah. but I, did, I didn't know enough. I was ignorant and naive. <laughs> he recognized, though. He that. did, yeah, he did. He recognized the talent, and um, so he helped me in so many ways. I, I said I went to four years of university at Memphis State. It was Memphis State University, then now it's University of Memphis. But I finished four years of college and didn't learn a, a modicum of what I learned with Elvis. You know, Elvis was such an incredible teacher of life and of how to, just the kind of person that, you know, you should aspire to be. And I was going to tell you too, when I was writing my memoir, I, I waited like 40 years, you know, after that was passed away. 
I didn't want to exploit my relationship with him, so I didn't write anything for 40 years, and then I waited until I had gone through my life circumstance with the former Bruce Jenner. And I thought I had my normal life. I left Elvis for a normal life. <laughs> I thought I had found it. <laughs> I had it for about hot five minutes. <laughs> With Bruce and my two beautiful sons, I wouldn't change anything, you know. I trust life, I trust God that life unfolds as it's meant to. And looking back, I would have made the same choices. You know, I had no idea about Bruce at the time. But I'm glad I didn't know because I, I wouldn't have Brandon and Brody and, and then my four beautiful little grandchildren. So I've learned to, to just trust, you know to trust life and trust God and let life unfold as it's meant to and then just make the best of it, you know? And, and you don't always have to understand something to just be kind about it. to be, so just be kind. And I was gonna tell you when I, thank you, when I wrote my memoir, I had an admonition to myself. I said, is it true? Is it necessary to tell the story and is it kind? So with those three things in mind, I was able to sit down and recount some of the things that have happened to me and for me in my life. And, but it, was a, it, was, it wasn't a, a joyful thing. It was very difficult. I don't know if any of you have written about your lives, but it's a tremendous responsibility to do justice to other people, to tell the truth, you know, but to still to, to, to do it with kindness um, and to try to have some sort of inspirational slant to the book. Now, later today, 5 o'clock, there's going to be an event that I know a lot of us are going to, and I, I don't want to end on you know, a note like that, but I just wanted to get your favorite, uh, and I don't want to intrude on whatever you'll say uh, this afternoon, but for the people here that might not be going, just your um, first impressions of your just a, a wonderful Lisa Marie experience. Yeah, you know, I had nothing but wonderful experiences with Lisa Marie. From the time I first met her until the last time I saw her, I've had nothing but wonderful encounters with her and heartwarming exchanges. She was a phenomenal human being. She was, I mean, incredibly loved by her daddy. Elvis adored her. And we would go in at night and tuck her in and call her Goober Nickel. We had all these little pet names for her. And you know, I've heard her do interviews where she said, oh, I was a terror, you know, I was a, I was a little brat. She really wasn't. My, my experience with her was always that she was affectionate and sweet and listened, you know, she was just, I thought she was a perfect little child. I just adored her. And I, the first time I ever met her, I was at, um, at Truesdale and I had just started living with Elvis and he said, I want you to meet Lisa and wanted her to meet me. So he said, Lisa, this is my new girlfriend. This is Linda. And hi, Linda. And she was very shy. And then after a few minutes, she had very long brown hair. I like to say it's when I dyed it brown. <laughs> Before I went back to my natural blonde. <laughs> but truly, it was long and brown. <laughs> And so she came up and, and said, Linda, can I brush your hair? And I said, of course, sweetheart. And I was like, oh my God, she wants to brush my hair. So she went up to the house and got a brush and started brushing my long brown hair. And that's how we very first met. And our relationship was solid and lovely the, the entire time I knew her. And I, I found her to be exquisitely beautiful and so talented and so real. I think the most um, resounding thing about Lisa Marie is that she was so authentic and I mean she you never had to second guess how she was feeling sometimes you know to a fault you go Johnny don't <laughs> bring it down a little but she, she you know she was so authentic so honest and I loved that about her you never had to wonder where she stood on anything well thank you for being a part of that uh, this afternoon There are so many people here this week that have so many, like I've said, intersecting lives. Uh, someone over here who knew or worked with this person, and it's just, it's just been amazing. There have been so many people that are returning guests, and so many people here for the first time. But I just want to utter what we all say, which is, thank God you're here. <laughs>